Okay. Well, I assumed you could hear me before. Yeah, for whatever reason, today and tomorrow apparently are abnormally hot, and then it returns to normal. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> that one, it might be. I believe video is going. Uh, according to that clock, we still have another minute or two until 10 o'clock. Um, I guess I could check what my phone tells me in terms of absolute time. 9.58 as well, so. I feel I should underline the word very. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm drawing that many pictures today, so the blue and red chalk right there. <laughs> eh, evidently, I'm not using a chalk holder. I would break a lot less chalk if I used a chalk holder, though. And as actually the one time I used your chalk holder, it was actually really nice to use. It is. I find it very comfortable. It's a bit, it's a bit big as a hole. It feels more like actually writing, whereas this, I feel like I'm writing like that, pressing into the board, but with the chalk holder, it felt more like actually... Also, I tend to press really hard on the board. This is actually a problem at Queen's. They have these weird cloth boards that you have to use really soft chalk on, and they wheel. It's very strange. But the fact that I press so hard on boards, even with the soft chalk, I am constantly worried that I'm actually damaging these cloth boards. I don't know if I am, but I do press really hard. It's such a weird thing. A very brief intro to the All right, so hi again, everybody. So um, this is going to be definitely a little bit more of a scatter shot talk than yesterday. Yesterday, I could start with the definition of a modular form, which I mean, everyone knows what functions are, so everyone knows what groups are, and you know, it's a lot easier to go and just get your hands dirty with modular forms. It is significantly harder to get your hands dirty with Gromov Witten invariance, but I'm going to try my best. Uh, I'm going to basically focus mostly on motivational examples 
and we'll see where we can go from there. So just to start with the ideas behind Gorm of Witten theory is the following question. How do you count rational curves in a variety? Now, just as an aside, I'm sure everyone in this room probably at some point has been asked by someone they've just met, a friend of a friend or anything like that, what do you do? And the way that I typically have learned to respond to this is basically, in terms of describing what I actually personally do, I start with the following question. How many lines pass through two points? Now, actually, one of the most amazing things about asking people this question is it's a really easy thing. You know, you draw two points. Here's two points. Oh, I get to use colored chalk. There's two points. We get exactly one straight line passing between them. Right? Done. There's one. That's it. Now, the funny thing about asking people this question, actually, Everyone thinks it's a trick question, and everyone thinks the answer is going to be significantly harder than it actually is. The answer is just one. If you take two points, they uniquely define a line, and we're good. Now, one can extend this, and if people already know this and are comfortable with it, you can extend this question to how many conics pass through five points. And of course, I have to be a little careful when I say five points. There's some subtleties on that. But you know, the gist of it is if you draw five points in a plane, you could ask the question, how many conics pass through all of these simultaneously? And the answer is actually still one. And the general question that actually comes from this, how many degree D rational curves pass through 3D minus 1 points in the plane. Now, of course, pertaining to that star over there, I really should say these points are in general position. And all I mean by that is that we don't have all of our points, for example, lying on a line. In fact, a little more than that. No three points lie on a line. Uh, no six points line of conic or stuff like that. So we have to be a little careful about general position. But in general, this is a well-posed question. And it's just a natural generalization of this. These are degree one curves. These are degree two curves. 3D minus, or three times one minus one is two. Three times two minus one is five. And so up to fourth. Now, it's pretty easy to see that, well, again, there's a unique line passing through two points. But why is it that degree d rational curves should pass through 3d minus 1 points? Why should we get a finite answer to that? And well, we can actually see this one relatively directly. So So why is this the right number of points? Well, let's just get our hands, let's drop my book on the floor. Let's just get our hands dirty and compute this directly. Now, for simplicity's sake, I'm actually going to work in the affine case. I'm going to not worry about the fact that we're working in P2 secretly. I'm just going to think of things in terms of two variable polynomials. And what I mean by that is we're working C2 versus uh, P2. It doesn't really make much of a difference. We're just taking away the part at infinity, but it's not going to be relevant for our case. OK, so let's try and figure out how we get this number 3D minus 1. Well, first of all, we want to talk about, well, polynomials. Uh, if we're looking at curves in C2, we're going to look at things that are solutions to polynomial equations. So we want to figure out 
how many parameters describe a degree D polynomial. Well, we can just write these down. A degree D polynomial in two variables is going to look like f of x, y, and it's going to be the sum from 0 is less than or equal to i plus j is less than or equal to d of some coefficients a, i, j, uh, x to the i, y to the j. That's exactly what a degree D polynomial in two variables looks like. And now these numbers here are actually our parameters, and we want to know how many of those are there. And it's pretty easy to see there are d plus 1 choose 2 coefficients. Aij. Okay, so that's the number of coefficients. Now, the problem with this is that this doesn't actually answer our question because we're actually asking about rational curves. They'll not be rational curves. In fact, they'll often be higher genus. So it's worth noting that for degree 1 and degree 2, these are rational curves. But it should be hopefully a well-known fact that degree 3 curves in the plane are actually, uh, or cubic curves, give us elliptic curves in generality, and so on and so forth. So we want to... Yeah. Well, and so that's exactly what we get. The genus of such a curve of a smooth... degree D curve is given by the genus of C is D minus 1 times D minus 2 over 2. So if we want our curve to be, you know, rational, we want to take something that looks like this, that's a degree 3 curve, and we want to deform it so that it has a node. And the number of nodes we need to deform, the number of nodes we need to, you know, have show up is exactly this many nodes. So we need to impose G of C nodes. And these are linear conditions. And so, if we want to talk about rational curves, we really should have d plus 1 times d plus 2 all over 2 minus d minus 1 d minus 2 over 2. This should be our number of parameters, and this is equal to 3d. Of course, we want 3d minus 1, and the minus 1 comes from the fact that we actually only care about the zeros of the polynomial, so we only care about it up to overall scaling. Oh, yeah. Sorry, say that again? Uh, the D plus it's D plus 1 times D plus 2 over 2. Uh, that's D plus 1 choose 2. Is it? Oh, okay. D plus 2 choose 2. This is actually the right answer, though. Anyways, so that should be apparently d plus 2 choose 2. Oh, that's right, yeah. I suppose I should probably fix that. Okay. So this is where we get that 3D minus 1, so that we end up with the space of rational degree D curves in P2 
is a 3D minus one dimensional space. And now imposing that a curve passes through a point is another linear condition. So when we impose 3D minus one linear conditions, we should get a finite number. And that's exactly why we ask about degree D rational curves passing through 3D minus one points. Okay, now where can we go with this? So the thing about this is, this is not actually the method that I am going to talk about to count curves. In fact, realistically, what we're talking about here is we're talking in this setting about counting curves by thinking about the equations that define the curves. So this is about looking at a curve in terms of its equa in terms of its defining equations. And this is something that's actually well sort of roughly called DT theory, Donaldson Thomas theory. And this is not what we're actually going to do, but really it sort of gives at least a motivational idea. We will instead look at these in a different way. So we look at a curve as maps from C, our some source curve, into X. And we look at a curve by parameterizing the curve instead of looking at based on its equations. We look at parameterizing curves instead of cutting them out by equations. And this is what leads us to gromov witten theory. OK, so how do we do this? This leads us to the notion of the moduli space of stable maps. So as I said, this idea of looking at the equation of the curve gives us Donaldson-Thomas theory. But instead, if we talk about parameterizing our curves, we get something new. So what we want to do is we want to talk about parameterizing the space of all maps from a curve into x. So let's just fix a smooth, a smooth projective variety. For the sake of most of what we're talking about, you can really just think of this as being P2, because for the most part, that's really what we're talking about for motivation here. But fix your favorite smooth projective variety. It can be P1, it can be a curve, who cares? So what we want to do is, as I said, we want to parameterize uh, curves inside that space. OK, so let's figure out how to do that. A stable map, uh, a genus G, n marked stable map into X is the following data. So first of all, we should have a, you know, an n marked stable curve, uh, genus G, well, something called a pre-stable curve, uh, 
And so what this is really supposed to be is that C is a genus G curve, and we just have some marked points on that curve. Um, actually, and we should be clear that C has arithmetic genus G. Uh, so it's allowed to be nodal, um, but it has at worst nodal singularities. So it is worth noting that in principle you could have far worse singularities on curve. You can have cusps, you can have tack nodes, et cetera, et cetera. But we're just going to say that our curve only is going to have at worst nodal singularities. And it turns out that's all we really need to worry about. So we have our source curve. And if we just left it at that, that would be our moduli space of curves. We also need a map f from our marked curve into x with finitely many automorphisms. And finally, many automorphisms really just means if we have diagrams, you know, C to C to X, that, you know, this, and here's F, and here's F, and here's some function phi from C to C, that would be an automorphism of the map, and we just say that we only have finitely many such things here. So it's an automorphism of C that respects the map. And the finitely many automorphisms of what we say is this is actually a stable curve. OK, so these are what we use as our building block to actually count curves in X. Now, the thing about this is if we want to work with these, we want to sort of be able to parameterize all of these. As before, we parameterized our curves by looking at the curves as zero sets of polynomials. In this case, we want to parameterize all of our possible curves by saying, let's parameterize all of these maps. Uh, there may be stability conditions or something like that. I don't actually know exactly. It's just that's the term that they use for it, finitely many automorphisms. Pre-stable means you may have worse than that. I think it comes from the moduli space of stable curves as we look at curves with finitely many automorphisms, and I think it's just an extension of that definition. There may be stability conditions involved in this, but I'm unaware of that. Um, anyways, so what we want... So we want the following. Uh, we want something that looks like uh, we're going to use, and you can just think of this as symbols for the time being, MGNX beta. And what this is supposed to be, and I'm putting a big question mark over that because this may or may not make sense, is this is supposed to be the moduli space. Uh, basically, this is supposed to be the thing that parameterizes all maps F from a genus well, basically, it parameterizes all stable maps. And there's one other little bit of information I put here. There's this beta here. And we also want that f of c, the image, that this has homology class beta in h2 of x. And the reason we throw that in there is this is some discrete, I should probably specify with the integers. This is some extra discrete data that we can use to control things about a curve. So for example, in P2, our homology is really, we talk about the degree of the curve. So this is just that extra discrete data where we specify that a curve has a given degree. So we want something that looks like this. But the problem is that, you know, in dream fantasy land, we would be able to build a you know, a topological space or a variety or a scheme that looks like this. 
but in actual LAN, this just doesn't work. Well, there is no nice space that does this. So we want to have something that acts like this, some space that consists, whose points consist of, well, all of the stable maps into our target X, but in practice, this rarely actually works. Pardon? Oh, there's no nice space, thank you. <laughs> yeah, in practice, we just don't actually have something that does this, but what we're going to do is, at least for the purposes of this talk, because to go into the details about how we fix this would take, you know, semesters. Uh, so we're just going to pretend that we do. And the reason we can kind of get away with this is because this machinery that we can construct of virtual fundamental class and everything actually lets us treat the thing that we get that does this as if it is a nice space in certain ways. So even though there is in general nothing that does what we want, there is some machinery that lets us do something that has the appropriate properties well enough. So for the sake of this, we can pretend that we do. And actually in the case of P2, we actually do get something that works anyhow. Well, in the case of P2 and genus zero. It turns out that genus zero is often much easier, but be that as it may. Oh yeah. So, well, let's start asking questions about this gadget, MGNX beta. So what can we say about MGNX beta? So the first thing we can say about this thing is that, well, if we're talking about parameterizing things, we want to know how many of something you know, there are. What we did for counting degree D curves in P2 is we looked at how many parameters we need to describe it, because that then told us how many points we needed to have it pass through. And similarly, we could ask, well, what is the dimension of this space? So it's, and I have to put this in quotes because this is not exactly true. It's something called virtual dimension, but we'll just call it dimension. Well, we write V dim of MGNX beta is equal to, well, it's dimension of X minus three times one minus G plus the integral over that curve class beta of the first churn class of the tangent bundle of x plus the number of marked points. So you have this lovely formula here that actually tells us what the dimension of this thing is. And a few remarks. So the first thing about this that's interesting, actually, is this points out very clearly why people, or one reason you might care about Calabi out threefolds. Uh, plus. This points out one reason why we care about CY3s. If you note that dimension of x being equal to 3 means this term disappears, and if the first term class of the tangent bundle is zero, this term disappears. And if you have no marked points, that term disappears. And we find that the virtual dimension of mg or mg zero x beta is always equal to zero. So this is something that's actually very nice. Is right off the bat, if we have a zero dimensional thing, then counting the number of curves, which somehow this thing is supposed to do, that this is just a finite collection of points, give or take. It's a finite collection of points, which means the number of curves is finite. You just have to take 
the Euler characteristic of this thing, or you have to count up the number of components, or however you want to do it. But the point is that's one reason that you can see right off the bat that Calabi-Yau threefolds are some way special. But the next point, and this comes back to earlier stuff, is, well, let's take a look at this thing for P2. But what G is equal to 0, um, X equal to P2. Well, if G is equal to 0, dimension of P2 is 2, we find that virtual dimension of M0, I'll say M00, uh, P2, and then, of course, we just say D for the degree. Well, this is just going to be equal to 2 minus 3 times 1 minus 0 plus the integral over, well, D times a hyperplane class of O of 3 uh, plus 0. If we just work this out, this gives us 3D minus 1. And so the virtual dimension of this moduli space is exactly that magic number we saw before. So that's you know, a nice comforting thing that this thing I'm claiming that we're interested in that's gonna do what we want is in fact at least the correct dimension. If it were 89 dimensional plus 3D, then this would be a problem, and it suggests we're doing something wrong. But at least, you know, a bit of a sanity check, this does have the correct dimension. Of course, it doesn't mean it's the right thing, but, you know, it's better than nothing. Oh, yeah. So, now the next thing we can say about this thing is, in sufficiently nice cases, and this is what's important, this is actually a compact orbital fold. And if you don't like the word orbital fold, pretend I just said manifold. Uh, this is a nice compact orbital fold, and so we can do intersection theory. And any time we can do intersection theory in a moduli space, we're generally pretty happy. So we can do intersection theory in this moduli space, and somehow or other, the intersection theory on this is what's supposed to give us our virtual counts of curves. Okay, so how do we do this? So this is where gromov witten invariants come into things. Actually, maybe one more thing. Uh, I don't know, I could put this in this section. So, the thing about these moduli spaces is, on one hand, great. They're a thing that parameterizes all of our curves. And if that was all it was, this wouldn't necessarily get us very far. It just gives us a thing that parameterizes all curves. But what's really nice about these things is they actually come with an enormous number of structural morphisms. These come with a ton of structural morphisms. And I'll list the most relevant ones here. We can sort of maybe fill in the blanks on some other ones. So the main, main structural morphisms for our purposes are we have evaluation maps which we denote EV sub I, that go from MGN X beta. And what these are supposed to do is if we have a map from a, you know, a point in this thing is supposed to represent a map from some marked curve into X. Well, if it's a marked curve and it has a map into X, we can evaluate the map at that point. And so this gives us a map into X. So this should take, f from 
c x one x n and this maps that to f of x i. So these are evaluation maps. So this is nice because this lets us ask questions like, well, if I have a curve and I want to say that this curve passes through a point, we can then say something about the evaluation map of this should actually you know, do something with a point. So this is kind of the main ones that we're going to use. But now also just as an aside, we also have other structural morphisms and I don't think I have time to get into the relevance of these. We also have a map pi, which takes us from m g n x beta. And so if we have, again, uh, you know, a stable map from a marked curve into x, we can just forget about the actual morphism itself and just remember the curve. And this gives us, in at least a few cases, a morphism just to the moduli space of curves. This itself does depend on that moduli space on the right hand existing, and there's some subtleties in terms of stabilization. But the point about this one here is that there are a ton of things we can say about boundary divisors and classes on this thing here, and we get a lot of relations over here that we can pull back to here. And these, this is the strength of this approach, is that all these different maps we get here interact very, very nicely to tell us stuff about what I'm going to describe next. Uh, the, about the f of c is equal to beta? Yeah, so that's not there because we've actually just completely forgot the map. All we're doing is we're remembering the source curve and completely forgetting x. Okay, now let's put all this stuff together into something useful. So what we want to do is who, so we want to, given, I don't know, Z1, Zn contained in X. So we have some sub-varieties, for example, Zi is equal to a point, X is equal to P2. So for example, you could take a collection of points in general position in P2, and we want to ask, you know, how many curves in uh, X are there which intersect the Zi non-trivially? And now these evaluation maps let us actually talk about this. So there's going to be some conditions on dimensions of these co-dimensions of these things to add up to the right thing so that we get some sensible notion of how many, but you know, this is a reasonable generalization of talking about counting the number of curves in P2 passing through 3D minus one points. Now, the idea is what we look at is we look at the fact that in cohomology, at least cohomology for nice spaces, the cup product is dual to intersection. Right? So this is something that is a useful fact, and this lets us do intersection theory using cohomology. So let's define the following. Um, let gamma 1 through gamma n be cohomology classes in our target space x, and then define the gromov witten invariant One gamma n g beta x. So we have these decorations g beta x, and what this is supposed to be is this is the integral over m g n x beta of e v one star gamma one cup e v n star gamma n. 
Now, I would actually like to take a brief moment to do a small public service announcement about LaTeX. Public service announcement. When we write something like this with those angled brackets here, you know, they're very scooped angle brackets, they're very wide. In LaTeX, you should use the commands backslash langle and wrangle, not the less than and greater than symbols. If you note, looking at some papers that they use the less than and greater than things, in LaTeX, this actually spaces things poorly and it tends to make your formulas look a little weird. These are supposed to be relational symbols that have something on both sides of it. These are actually meant to be brackets of a certain kind. So if you're writing things like gromov witten invariants or inner products or anything that uses those very nice scoopy angular brackets, these are the correct things to use in LaTeX, not these. That's the public service announcement. Okay. That has nothing to do with my talk, though. Okay, so what is this, what is this thing I've just written down here? So this is a thing with some brackets. This is I have some cohomology classes that I'm integrating over this space here. And assuming it's a manifold, which we'll pretend it is, then assuming that the, you know, the dimensions of these or the degree of all these things add up appropriately, then this should give us a number. And it's worth noting this is actually all done in rational cohomology, so in particular this should give us a rational number. And actually, the reason I should specify it's a rational number and tragically not an integer, it has to do with the fact that MGNX beta is not actually a manifold, it's an orbifold. And so when we're doing intersection theorem on an orbifold, we don't necessarily get, uh, you know, integers. So in the best of circumstances, you get integers. And if you ever compute one of these and you do get integers, that should make your heart feel warm and fuzzy inside. That's a great thing. Um, but it's not always going to be the case. Sometimes you even get negative numbers, and that's just weird. Um, so it should give us a rational number. And the idea is that this should count. So I have to say count, because if rational numbers are showing up, what does it count? The number of genus G curves in X such that, well, f of X1 is in Z1, and so on and so forth. f of Xn is in Zn, where gamma i is actually the Poincaré dual of the Zi's. So if we pick our cohomology classes gamma such that they're Poincaré dual of actual you know, subvarieties, then morally speaking, this number here tells you the number of curves that actually will intersect these things non-trivially. And if you think about that, what we're doing here is when we pull back EV1 star of gamma 1, what we're saying is we want to look at the locus of all curves such that their first marked point intersects the class Z1 or intersects gamma 1 non-trivially, and so on and so forth. So all we're saying is that for each of our marked points, they have to actually hit the, the subvarieties Zi. That's exactly what that is supposed to be saying. Again, the devil is in the details, but morally, the idea is hopefully clear. So ideally, in the best of all possible worlds, this actually lets us answer our questions. We build a moduli space. We do intersection theory on that moduli space. In the best of all worlds,
This is all we need. We build a moduli space. of maps, do intersection theory on it, and we get our answer. Now, the problem is that this is not the best of all possible worlds. And as I said, there are issues in terms of the fact that this is in general going to be a rational number. In worse situations, where moduli space is actually something that we don't think it is, as I said, you can actually get negative numbers. And it's not really always very clear what exactly it means when you get a negative gromov Witten invariant. It's, I still actually admittedly don't understand that, and it doesn't seem like I'm the only one who doesn't completely get that. Um, but this is the right idea. Now, just as an example, If we were to look at, you know, if we look at 3D minus one copies of a point pulled back, zero D times a hyperplane class in P2, this thing here, according to what I'm saying, this thing should morally count the number of degree D rational curves in P2 passing through 3D minus one points. That's what this thing should be. And it turns out that this is exactly what we want. So this is one of those cases where we are, in fact, in the best of all possible worlds. And part of what this is, and part of why this is kind of a nice setup, is that this issue of making sure that our points in general position is magically taken care of by the fact that we deal with cohomology. That's what cohomology does in terms of intersection theory. It lets us pretend things are actually transverse intersections when they may or may not be. It lets us take our points in general position. This exactly takes care of that. Even though we're pulling back the same cohomology class over and over and over, each of those represents actually a point in general position. So when we do this, we really get the number of degree D rational curves passing through 3D minus one points in general position. So the fact that we're working with cohomology lets us actually do this stuff pretty nicely. Okay. So now the one problem with what I've said here is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to count concrete things. We're trying to count curves with some incidence conditions. But realistically, if you look at what I've done, you can make the argument I've actually just made everything worse. This really just replaces one question with a really sort of terrifyingly complex formalism. And it's not actually clear that what I've done is any easier. So one should hope that if you, you know, introduce new machinery, the goal of that machinery is actually to make your life better. And it's really not clear that that's actually what I've done here. These moduli spaces, I keep saying that they're not really you know, nice manifolds. In fact, they can be pretty much arbitrarily bad if you want them to be. There's, this is really sort of going into the land of stacks, and if you want to, into derived algebraic geometry and a whole bunch of different stuff. And it's really not obvious that that's the easiest way to say, well, how many curves are doing this? But it turns out that with this increase in machinery, we actually get a whole bunch of other stuff that comes with that. And it turns out that we get a lot of relations that make our life easier. So with this machinery, we get a lot of structure. And this structure lets us actually do things nicely. So for example, 
one can point out that the gromov witten invariants himself, these numbers, satisfy a lot of different relations. In fact, the gromov witten invariants satisfy a list of axioms. I forget exactly how many of them. I think that the without any gravitational descendants, there's three main axioms. So one, the fundamental class axiom. And this tells us that if we look at, you know, gamma of Whitney event gamma one to gamma n minus one, the fundamental class of X, so that certainly is a cohomology class. And if we do G beta X, that well, okay, let's ask ourselves what should this actually be? So we're saying that we're supposed to have some points that <clears throat> intersect some classes somewhere in there, and we're supposed to have the nth marked point intersect X itself. But that's a trivial condition. If we have a map into X, obviously the nth marked point evaluates as being an X. That's kind of a, you know, not really saying much. And so because of that, this is actually going to be equal to gamma 1, gamma n minus 1, g beta x. Okay, that seems pretty silly, but it still is kind of an important thing. And there's some slight conditions on n and g to make sure our moduli space actually exists. But it is worth noting this actually lets a lot of gromov witten invariants vanish directly. Because the co-dimension of these things here, if that adds up to the right dimension, then the co-dimension of these things here can't add up to the right dimension. So this actually tells us a lot of gromov witten invariants are actually zero. OK, so that's nice. The divisor axiom, well, similarly, if we let gamma be in h2 of x. And let's say we want it to represent the class of a divisor, but it doesn't actually have to. It could just be something in H2. Uh, then, well, gamma 1, gamma n minus 1, gamma, and g beta x. Well, think again here. So what we have is we have the condition that we want the last marked point on our curve to actually intersect a divisor. Well. If we have a one-dimensional cycle and an n minus one-dimensional cycle in X, how many different places can intersect that divisor? Well, it can intersect at exactly the intersection of those two. And so this gives us that times gamma 1, gamma yeah. n minus 1, g beta x. So all of the classes coming from H2 really actually don't do very much in terms of gromov witten invariants. We can always just pull them outside and we get some number in front of it. OK, and then there's also stuff involving the point mapping app. There's a point mapping axiom which says that if our class is 0, If beta is equal to 0, well, if beta is equal to 0, we don't really get very much. Then gamma 1, gamma n, g 0, x. Well, if our class is 0, that means our curve actually has to map to a point. And so this is actually going to be equal to uh, the integral over x of gamma 1 cup, gamma 2 cup, gamma 3, if n is equal to 3 and is 0 otherwise. So it's worth noting that in some sense you can actually recover your cohomology from these gromov witten invariants. So that's a little bit um, not accurate to say that. But you know your cohomology actually does show up in these things here. So a gromov witten invariants do satisfy a lot of properties. And this is just the first list of them. But we can actually do a lot more with this. And we can start pointing out that from these things here,
We see that the gromov witten theory of curves and surfaces is actually particularly trivial. And there's a couple subtleties involving that, but realistically speaking, for curves, all we get are divisor classes, so everything just can come out of there. For surfaces, we get either divisor classes or point classes, so everything on a surface is really just going to come down to understanding what happens with point classes. So this lets us talk about the gromov witten variance of P2 in a particularly nice way. Now, the last real thing that I want to point out is that you can do even more with this stuff here. And there's this thing called the gromov witten potential that sort of makes everything work nicely. So... If you have a whole bunch of numerical invariants, what's the first thing you want to do with them? Of course, you want to assemble them into a generating function. And so we define phi xg so this is supposed to be a generating function, and it is going to be, well, actually, we should really first choose a basis, uh, gamma naught, gamma n of h star of x. So we need to actually have a base of this, because we're going to be summing over things. And that, so given that, we sum over n naught, or k naught, I should say, to kn, the sum over all classes in H2 of X. So this is going to basically include all of our invariants for all curve classes and all different cohomological insertions. And this is going to be gamma naught to the K naught, gamma N to the KN, G beta X. And now, of course, to keep track of these invariants, if we want this to be a formal power series and not just some horrifically infinite sum, we then just add in the condition that we have some formal variables, y naught to the k naught over y naught factorial, y n to the k n over k n factorial, and then some other formal variable q, which keeps track of our homology class. Now, exactly what this variable here is, there's a lot of different settings. Sometimes you can actually let that be an honest complex number, in which case it's sort of a parameter on our Kähler moduli space. I think of it as a formal variable. Uh, oh, thank you. Sorry, that's k0 factorial. So we get this generating function here because, you know, that's what you should do when you have a whole bunch of numerical invariants. And now we can ask ourselves, considering that this generating function here encodes literally all of our, Gromov -Whitney, our genus G Gromov-Whitney invariants, literally all of them, they're all there. Considering that it does that, what can we say about this generating function? Does it satisfy any nice differential equations? And it turns out, well, you can do a lot of stuff with this. So first of all, it actually lets us define a deformed cup product, quantum cohomology. It actually defines what's called a Frobenius manifold structure on the cohomology, but uh, for our purposes, we can really say that we can define a new product, gamma 1 star, gamma, or gamma i star, gamma j star. Uh, so this is supposed to be a product of these two things, and what this is going to be is it's going to be the sum from k is equal to 0 to n of del i, del j, del k of phi uh, I think I just want to do 0 uh, x. So we look at the genus 0 potential function. We take its triple derivatives, 
And then we then do gamma k here. Now it's worth noting I'm doing lower subscripts here and upper subscripts here. Well, that's just a convenience thing. Gamma k is equal to the sum of L is equal to zero to M of G uh, L K gamma L, where this is sort of the inverse of the intersection matrix. Doesn't matter too much. But the point is though, this actually defines a brand new product on cohomology. And it is actually just a deformation of the ordinary cut product. And again, for Beanie's manifold structure, this lets us do a bunch of stuff. Now, the other thing that we get out of this And this is, I think, the more important thing in terms of computations. Is that these satisfy a series of partial differential equations. Zero x satisfies what's called the WDVV equations. I think Witten, Degraff, Verlinde, and Verlinde are the names. Uh, And what these equations are, uh, I wrote them down somewhere, where are they? What they are is, they are the sum from j, k is equal to zero to m of del, uh, well, del two, del three, del k of phi zero x, g, k, j, uh, del 1, del r, del j of phi 0x. So we take this collection here, and this is going to be equal to some j and k is equal to 0 to n of del 1, del 2, del k of phi 0x, g, k, j of del r del j del 3 of phi 0 x. So this looks a little bit messy, but what this is interesting for any choice of variables, I guess I 2, 3, 1, and r, for any choice of uh, variables, that this is a set of partial differential equations that satisfies. Now, what we get from that is the following very nice formula. So on its own, it just tells us that we have a partial differential equation that our general functions satisfy. But when we actually apply it and ask, well, what do we get? So let ND denote the number of degree D Genus zero curves in P2 passing through our 3D minus one points. Well, we already know the first couple of them, obviously one and one, but then it turns out that we get a nice formula, a recursive formula for these, where ND is going to be the sum d1 plus d2 is equal to d of n d1 n d2 times d1 squared d2 squared 3d minus 4 over 3 d1 minus 2 minus d1 cubed d2 3d minus 4 over 3d1 minus 1. And this gives us, following from that partial differential equation up there, applied to the potential function for P2, this gives us the generating function, or sorry, the recursive formula to count the number of degree D genus zero curves passing through degree D minus one point. And that's it. Oh. 
Basically, yeah. So this is where, uh, as I said, we have these structure morphisms that take us from our moduli space of stable maps, and they map us to these other smaller moduli space, sometimes just the moduli space of curves, and then you use relations amongst things happening there, you pull them back to the moduli space of stable maps, and that's where we get things like this coming from. Yeah. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, actually. No, certainly not. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, for genus zero, everything's nicer. Every little thing you do for genus zero is so much easier than for higher genus. I don't know what actually it looks like for higher genus. Yeah. So, uh, so there are in higher genus really is a lot harder. Um, I mean, we can do, you can specifically compute these a little bit. Uh, although, actually, to be fair, almost all the cases I can think of, higher genus stuff starts to get really complicated, at least from the gromov witten standpoint. So one thing that I've elided over in everything I'm saying here is that because of the fact that we're counting maps from a curve instead of actual curves, there are some messy dangers in that. So for example, if we're talking about, you know, curves, if you have a, there's a curve that's nicely happily embedded in something, uh, maybe it's a rigid curve. That's, you know, the, again, a good situation where your curve itself can't actually move. So that should be a distinct thing. The problem is that if you have like a rigid P1 in some variety and you're saying, well, let's talk about degree D maps from genus zero curves into that, the problem is you can get multiple covers showing up. And these multiple covers aren't counting new curves. They're counting multiple covers. And so your gromov witten invariance, as much as you, I want to tell you that they always are telling you the counts of curves, this is just a flat out lie. Your gromov witten invariants don't necessarily count things. If you're careful about things, and generally when you're dealing with primitive classes, so you can't have multiple covers, okay, then you're actually usually in a pretty good spot. But the moment you start talking about non-primitive classes, a lot of this stuff gets a lot harder. And you have to be careful that with genus zero, it's not so bad. You have this uh, Gopakuma Vafa Aspinall Morrison type formulas that actually let you do this and take account of it pretty well. For higher genus, I actually don't know if there's anything figured out for that at the moment. I'm unaware of anything off the top of my head that lets us take care of that. So higher genus gets way harder, particularly for allowing non primitive classes. With primitive classes, then we can say stuff, for example, K3 surfaces. We can count curves in K3 surfaces within primitive classes. For non-primitive classes in higher genus, I don't think that's solved. So. Not a given that you have that. So it's not necessarily the case that these are modular, though in, again, the cases that are you know, the best of worlds, they usually are. Um, but even with K3 surfaces, that these potential functions are not necessarily modular.
we knew that we had to come up with the thing. Um, certainly with P2, it doesn't really count. Um, but it's because the probably class of the point of P2 is not this is a fixed point you care about. So if you're doing things, maybe I will vary. But the cohomology class of the point of P2 is essentially the class of the general point, right? I mean, it's sort of like when you take the you know, hyperplane class and have hyperplane class of P2, right? Yeah, right? We're not saying we're intersecting a line with an exact copy of that. What this is really seemingly giving you is you take two lines of general position and ask what is their intersection. And that is the point of general position. Right? My, the way I always view this is that the cohomology, the intersection theory, done properly always talks about these 